Wrestling acts or whatever you'd like to do to warm up. We have sparkly high shadow. Jesse. Oh, no, that's... Our big moment in the sun. Yeah, we'll go there. So Jesse brought over this uh, sparkly eye shadow that we were all going to wear for our presentation. And then we just totally... We had a late start this morning. Late start? I was... I was thinking of the question. How about Doug Cloud? How you can help part, I'm actually gonna go to the Google Doc where you can all the notes. Um, and then mention the concerns and the fact that there are core issues in, <coughs> in my head. She's <laughs> popped. Hey everybody! Hey everybody! Hey! hey. All right. So uh, I hope you're in the right room. We're here to talk today about Spark, um, and you might be asking, what the heck is Spark? Spark is um, a couple of things. Primarily, what it is is it's an initiative to get uh, really great authoring experience uh, improvements into Drupal 8 core. Uh, but the method with which we're going about doing that is we're actually building these tools on Drupal 7 first as a Drupal 7 distribution. Uh, for a couple of reasons, we want to, uh, you know, A, prove that these ideas can kind of work in, a, in an, er you know, an arena where they can be iterated on really fast and the, the foundation isn't shifting below us. Um, and we also want to, like, kind of see how these things work in the wild. So, you know, how are people using them on real sites with real users and real content so we can sort of validate the approaches that we're taking. So. Um, this was an initiative initially announced by uh, Dries back around the time of DrupalCon in Denver uh, as sort of a, uh, a way of, of pushing authoring experience improvements to the, to the forefront of the development cycle. And why do we care about that? Why do we care about authors and, and their kind of things? Um, uh, a big reason why we care about that is because more and more, uh, you know, uh, companies and, and organizations and other uh, people like that are starting to realize that, you know, they have these people, content authors or content editors or whatever you want to call them, who are sort of like the victims of Drupal. You know, it's like, we all build the site and it's all lovely and great and then we're like, there you go, and then we go off to build the next big thing. And these people are stuck using whatever we build for like 30 hours a week of just sitting there in front of it and entering content and editing things and stuff like that. And their experience with Drupal is actually really, really poor unless the implementer put an extra amount of elbow grease in front of it, you know, configured WYSIWYG API, configured a bunch of views to put some dashboard things in that made sense and this sort of thing. And, you know, a lot of times Drupal's actually losing deals even when it's a better system, you know, more flexible, more architected, all that kind of stuff, just because there's so much upfront work that has to go into Drupal to make it usable by these people. And it really can't be put in front of content editors in its current state. So our process was we, uh, we went about looking at a bunch of different uh, alternatives to Drupal, not only just open source alternatives like WordPress, but also things like Sitecore 
and CQ5 and some proprietary alternatives as well. And sort of, you know, did the map around like sort of the strengths and weaknesses of each platform. And what we found is that Drupal wins on the technical decision hands down. There's really nothing out there that can touch Drupal in terms of its flexibility, its modularity, its architecture, all of the stuff that we love about it. But unfortunately, on the authoring experience side, it's extremely poor. Um, and the proprietary solutions are kicking our ass right now. And worse, the, uh, the open source, uh, you know, other open source content managers are really starting to catch up and surpass Drupal as well. And that really leaves us in a tricky state. Because in a lot of these companies, they've figured out that they can't trust the IT people to make these decisions on what CMS to use. They also have to bring in the victims and they're part of the choice as well. And so really what Drupal needs to do is impress both audiences out of the box. So we looked at what authoring experience looks like and we sort of divided into nine different quadrants. Inline editing, workflow tools, content staging, media management, layouts, localization, and mobile authoring. That's really what people that we talk to, and we talk to large organizations, small organizations, individuals, this is what they mean when they mean authoring experience. And so we sort of mapped out how Drupal works. Drupal's great in workflow. There's a ton of really awesome contributing modules that can get us there with that. There's a lot of good uh, options for media management, layouts, there's panels, display suite, things like that. But other areas like inline editing, mobile authoring, some of those were, were really poor and there's really no alternatives in, in Contrib. It's like you couldn't actually get these features with contributed modules, at least without a whole bunch of work. Um, so the goal is to build kick-ass author experience for Drupal 7 so people can use it now and then propose it for inclusion in Drupal 8 core. And so that's what we've been working on since Denver. So who is working on this stuff? This is the Spark team. Uh, so Dries is the product owner. I am the uh, engineering manager, or as I like to say, the calendar wrangler. Um, Kevin O'Leary is our uh, creative lead. He sort of takes all these different CMSs and he tries them out and he comes up with proposals. Wim Lears is our code ass kicker. He's uh, working on the inline editing feature. Uh, Gabor Hoysi is also known as a Drupal encyclopedia. He's uh, been in Drupal project for like 10 years now or nine. something? Nine. I'm sorry. He's only nine. <laughs> Step up, Gabor. Come on. You know? um, yes, and so he's been working a lot on the layout tools. Jesse Beach is our front end ninja. Uh, who has been doing a bunch of stuff on responsive design and, and building JavaScript applications. Uh, and then Preston So is, uh, is a team member who takes Kevin's ideas and then bangs them out in HTML and, and CSS just without any Drupal as fast as possible so we can throw them in front of users and see how these guys and ideas work. And we do work. user testing with Darmesh. That's true. We also do user testing with Darmesh. I should adjust the slide to put his head in there. Um, who will use Spark? We kind of hope everyone will use Spark. The way Spark has been architected is Spark itself is just a distribution, it's just glue code around separate contributed modules that each are layered on top of existing community solutions. So for example, the edit module layers on top of the entity API, the field API pane editor or FAPE module, um, and the Aloha editor uh, editor. Uh, Heimo, uh, Heimo? Heimo, I'm sorry, uh, is here from the Aloha project as well as Renee um, to talk to you about that. Layout module layers on top of C tools, and for now, panelizer and panels, all that kind of stuff. Although the way it's been architected, it could also go on top of Display Suite or other things. And then the navbar module is very new. We just sort of banged it out in the last week so we could show something. Um, shh, don't tell Dries. Uh, anyway, <laughs> um, but we think we might layer on top of the. Uh, there's a cool module called Interactive Information Bar that sort of is an abstraction around toolbar design so things can insert and update. We don't know yet how this is all going to play out, but these are what we're trying to do is find existing community like sort of plumbing pieces that work really well, build a module that hooks them all together in a nice user interface, and then use Spark as a means of demonstrating them. But hopefully these pieces can be reused in existing sites, they can be pulled into other distributions, whatever people want to do. So what's in the Spark roadmap? You know, kind of all the nine, or I guess it's only seven things uh, we laid out. Uh, content creation editing, page content layout tools, dashboards, blah, 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 you guys can read. Um, and where we're at with those things is uh, we have implementation well underway for both the content creation and editing and the uh, layout designer things. So we'll, we'll be able to demonstrate that today. We have designs and prototypes for the dashboard workflow and mobile authoring stuff. Um, and then the rest of that stuff we're not really touching as part of Spark at the moment. The uh, content staging initiative is actually, we, we, we were doing that as part of large scale Drupal and uh, Neil Hastings from phase two over there is sort of leading the development of that project. Um, it's called CSI, which stands for? Content staging initiative. There we go, yes. Because you can't have an initiative without a goofy acronym. It's just a rule, so. Um, so blah, 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 blah. How about you see it in action? Does that sound fun? Yay, all right. 
Um, so this that we'll be demoing is actually Spark Alpha 5, which is available on the project page. You can download it right now. Um, or if you go to demo.sparkdrupal.com, you can also play with it there. But please be nice and don't F it up too bad. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, very quickly, I'll show you the fun stuff on the front end. What we're looking to do with the layout um, UI is to provide site builders with a way to uh, build layouts for their site that work in a responsive way, right? So we have a little preview bar up here that takes the layout associated with this page and provides you a view of that page with the media queries and everything um, applying correctly. So if we go down into the administration, into panels. So I'm going to go into the custom lands of panels and get the layout that's associated with that front page. So what we've done here is we've taken three separate elements and created an application that brings them all together. Um, we have breakpoints, grids, and regions that all come together to provide a way for a site builder to define a layout on a per-step basis. So we have a screen that's uh, 320 pixels wide here, a 760 uh, pixel wide screen, and a 110 pixel wide screen, which is a little bit bigger than this screen. One of the things that we're trying to do is to provide um, a means of creating responsive layouts that work with the way that browsers think about layout. So the regions that are presented here, for each one of these steps, are the regions that are defined in the DOM, in the document object. We don't allow users to present or create a layout that um, conflicts with the way that those regions are presented in the DOM. So if I move my header A below header C, that is going to create a, a DOM change. Um, eventually, we'll inform the user that that's not, um, ask them if they actually want to make that change. We're also experimenting with ways of producing columned and uh, layouts that work with the way that um, grid systems today work. So you can imagine we've defined this region header B as a uh, two column region, region header uh, C as a one column region, and because the two together add up to three. There's room for them to spread across that top row. Okay. And let me do that again. So at the moment, this is all working with panels. If I save this, it will be reflected on the front end um, when I'm down at a small size screen. Let's see what else we can show. We've also provided a way to insert new regions, so I can put a bunch of junk in there and have that added and then order it among the other ones. So the way that we've architected um, let's see what I have. panels and layouts. Actually, Gabor, I think I'm going to let you talk about this bit because, sure. yeah, you're the one who knows it the best. So basically, I have four different objects. You have layouts, uh, which work from breakpoints and they work from grids and they work and they work with uh, with regions. The simplest thing is regions. We implemented these as CTOOLS exportable objects. They are just labels. They don't have any relation to your other regions. Uh, so you give them a label um, and you can export and push this to your site. And then we have grids, which are a little bit more elaborate. Uh, these have pluggable CSS generators, but we generate CSS for them out of, out of the box. The reason we made the CSS uh, grid tool is that we wanted to have meta information about your grids. So we know you have a six column grid that's like demoed here and you can edit how many columns you want and how wide the padding or gutter is gonna be on the grid. And that C tool is exportable and can be pushed to your live site again. And then we have breakpoints that define all those points there that were applied to the layouts. So you can add any number of breakpoints and then say how wide they are and which grids are applied to your breakpoints. So you can have any, num any number of breakpoints associated with any number of grids. And then these three data sources are combined into layouts where you actually added these, these things together and then the relations of them and the, and the um, placement of them form what shows on the front end. And if you see this on the front end, it's basically out output as a panel and it's totally compatible with 
um, panels IPE. So you can like put stuff there, drag and drop stuff around, or if you resize your window, then it's gonna adapt to the breakpoints that you were applied. That's it. Is that cool stuff? Yay? Yay! All right. Uh, so now we'll have uh, Jaimo uh, demonstrate a little bit about the Aloha editor, which is, uh, well, I'll let him say what it is, but it's an HTML5 uh, WYSIWYG editor, plus plus. Hello. Hello. Thank you, Angie. So my name is Jaimo, um, and I see as you guys like acronyms, like you have the project LSD. <laughs> In my company, I'm dope. So, <laughs> director of product experience, that's a perfect fit, I would say. Um, well, let me say something about the Aloha editor. I was like um, building an inline editor in 2003 uh, with IE 5.5. This was the first time a content edit table was implemented in uh, IE 5.5. And then people continued to say, why is editing so weird on the internet? Why isn't it like Word? That's much easier. So, and I was thinking about what had Word done, what had Microsoft done to work, work to make editing easy? Well, some of you guys, I see you are all young guys, so maybe you don't remember. In the 90s, you know, you had MS-DOS, right? And if you wanted to edit some content, you had to start MS-DOS Word, right? And you started typing and editing, and you made something bold, but you couldn't see anything. You had this 8025 screen, you know? You couldn't see what you're doing. So what you did is you printed the paper, you waited, you listen to the printer like zzzz, line per line, and after 20 minutes you could see, oh God, I have missed some formatting. And what Microsoft did, they put it the paper on the screen, and you could see actually what you was editing on the screen. The paper was on the screen, so this was amazing. Now these days we don't have, we don't exchange paper, but we exchange information on the internet on websites. So why don't we edit websites as they are? Why do we have to load an editor in a frame or whatever? Why can't we just edit the content, right? And with HTML, we have a lot of opportunities to format content. So you could make a website that looks like this. This is from uh, Zastronaut. He's showing some HTML transformation. So you can do this with CSS. You can uh, look, make a website look like this. So what a real good editor these days should be able to do is to make this content editable as it is. You don't have to pop up a screen or do something. You just click into it and you start editing. <laughs> so this is what Allo Editor is all about. And uh, we started doing this project and we wanted to make the web editable just as easy as that. But when it comes to, to editing stuff, you know, usually don't have this weird uh, formatting. You have normal websites, something like this, and you want to edit content like this. The real problems in the world, in the world usually are not like make content like on the cube edit table. It's just let people type and format what they see, right? And that's what we try to do. And we care a lot about the user experience what, what does the user feel when he starts editing? What's the result? And we don't care only about the users doing that, but also the developers. I don't know if anybody of you has ever looked at the source code some editors produce, so that's not that much fun, right? So um, when I'm here in a low editor, we also have some like tiny little functionalities. So uh, we have this toolbar. It looks like Word, which makes a lot of people happy. So, but uh, they feel good to see it. Oh, it's like Word. Um, we have these toolbars, and when I want to make this Word bold, usually I have to like select the whole Word, right? But I, I miss the first character, right? So what happens is only part of the Word is getting bold, right? So with a low editor, we have a little tiny functionality. If a selection is collapsed and you click on bold, what do you think, what does that mean? A collapsed selection cannot be bold, so probably you mean the word, right? So we make the whole word for you bold. So it's much easier to select things. But the low editor offers you also like table 
uh, editing, you can jump through the table like you would do in Word, and with a tap you get a new row, you can select rows, uh, delete rows, modify, and do things. So this is all the functionality Allo Editor comes with. We also have like semantic for formatting, so if you want to say um, um, edit uh, abbreviations, right? You click on the content, you see it immediately. What we do is like, you see, you have three abbreviations, but the one I'm editing is highlighted once I edit it, right? And when I type, the change is immediately applied to the content. So you don't need to confirm or do anything else. So we think that confirming an action is something usually you don't need. When you do it, you want to do it. So why should you confirm it? Have you ever been in the elevator and you press floor nine, confirm? <laughs> so, <laughs> doesn't make sense to me, right? So uh, this is one of the things. But then we also have another thing, like if you write something in Deutsch, right? Oh, this is not really Deutsch. This is Deutsch. And you can annotate it with Deutsch, German. So I don't see anything. So how the heck do I know that this has an annotation? So this is why we have the meta view of a low editor. That means we outline the elements you're editing. You know? So you don't need to edit the source code because we show you the source. We show you what you're editing. And you see, this is annotated content, right? And things that you see immediately, we don't need to annotate, like bold or, or strike through. You see that, but we don't need to annotate. But the all, all the other content is annotated, right? And you can here, on this screen, you can just uh, edit right away. So, but to be honest, um, I mean, Drupal is cool. It, it has like 2% of the internet is based on Drupal. But to be honest, people don't create content in Drupal. Where they really create content is still Word. <laughs> so the major current in creation happens on Word. And then, then that, that's kind of a staging, right? So they have these Word documents, they send them around, they sign them, they do stuff, and then somebody says, okay, you can publish that. And now what happens? Somebody has a Word document, something like this, right? With annotations and everything. And Ooh. <laughs> and it should appear on a website, right? And you should respect this, the, the corporate identity. So, <laughs> man, that's a lot of work. So I'm, I'm busy with that like half the day, I would say. Um, so this is, oh, this was wrong. So this is uh, why we spend a lot of time to make like this very simple functionality with like copy-paste working. So when I copy-paste this content here, <laughs> So now let's check, let's check. It looks good, but now let's check if it's really good. Okay, we have here, man, word is weird. Okay, this is an H1 styling uh, headline. I don't know how you see it in this word, but <laughs> it is H1. This is an H2 headline, so let's check that. We have an H1, we have a, an H2. This is italic. It is italic. Oh, we removed this color formatting because it's not in our corporate identity, so it's not there. We have the, the ordered list, unordered list. We have the table. We have here um, combined cells, but it's still working the table. And we have a link. Look at that. Oh, it has a title. And now let's see if the link is correct. Oh, this could be something that's broken, so let's check how the li link looks on Word. Oh, God. <laughs> okay, look at the link. This is very easy, you know. If you want to make a link in, <laughs> in Word, it's very easy. Okay, see, the link is correct. So we did the right thing, and even the screen tip is correct. That's awesome, man. So we have now the right thing on our website. Isn't that beautiful? Well, maybe for the user it is. <laughs> now, 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 wait a moment, wait a moment. Most of you guys are developers, 
So first thing you do is you look on the source code, right? Yeah. Ah. <laughs> okay, let's look on the source code. Oh, that looks like more or less like it should look. Okay. I admit we have some extra empty paragraphs. That should not be. But at the end of the day, we have a pretty good table. The links are working, the content is correct, we don't have this spam thing, we don't have this weird word thing. So it's a pretty good thing you can work with, I think. Yeah. And it's working with all kinds of combinations. So um, a low editor is working from IE7 on. <laughs> IE7. <laughs> From IE7 on, and uh, we tested this uh, implementation with XP, Windows 7, uh, 2003, 2010, in all combinations on the Macs and so on. And weird things happening, you know. This list, for instance, in XP, in XP 2003, these links have different class names depending on the language package you have on Windows. Imagine that. So it's really, really weird, but we did it. And if you want to see what you can do with Aloha Editor, you can do really, really, really cool stuff. Then you should go to YouTube and watch this video. So that's all from my side. Thank you very much. So pretty cool, yeah? Yeah. yeah. So I just want to say one more shout out while we have the floor here. Uh, Haimo actually changed the license of Aloha. The whole to project. The it's entire project to GPL version 2 plus so that it could be used in Drupal. So thank you. And now Wim is going to talk about uh, our implementation of e uh, Aloha in uh, Spark. Right. Um, so as you can see, Aloha Editor can do some pretty, pretty damn cool stuff. Um, we are implementing currently only a subset, but we, are in the um, we have the possibility to add, of course, more plugins to add the entire possible feature set of Aloha. And it's actually quite easy to write plugins for Aloha, much like uh, Drupal has modules, Aloha has plugins. Um, so Currently, with uh, the edit module, if this local site works, okay, great. Um, so this is Spark Alpha 5, as Angie said. So all of this actually works on your local host as well if you download and install it. So this is just some kind of demo content. And if we go to the regular way of editing it, the way that we're all used to, um, it's looking like this, right? It's a long list of fields, really long list of fields. <laughs> with not such great UX for editing it. And there's a bunch of, of text here with um, no paragraph text, and so no P text, no BR text, and so on. So what we try to do is to make everything possible, uh, to make it possible to edit everything on the front end, right where you see it. So this, is only, this only makes it possible to edit things that are visible, but those are the things that make sense to change, right? If you're looking at something and you see a mistake, you can quickly correct it because you can edit it in line. So that's what I'm going to show you. Um, so once you toggle into edit mode, um, there is some highlighting uh, for everything that is editable. So st let's start with a simple field. For, f for example, a Boolean field, you get to see a um, simple form. You hit save, and the text is updated right away. So it's re-rendered. Uh, each field separately can be re-rendered and displayed it right in there. Let's see another simple one. Also works right away. Now let's look at a slightly more complex one. Let's just lead a tag here. And that also works. Great. Um, but let's jump to the interesting part, the WYSIWYG editing part. Um, as you can see, our UI looks slightly different. We are overriding parts of uh, Aloha, Aloha's default UI um, to make it fit in better with what we are doing. Um, the save and close buttons, are, by the way, are going away, so it will look nicer eventually. Um, so let's start with simple things like balding and italics and whatnot. Um, but you can also do interesting things such as um, automatic tabbing. And if you then try to tab it further, that actually fails because it doesn't make sense. But if you go to the next one, that does make sense. So that does is, is allowed by a low editor. 
So this is all thanks to Aloha Editor that, it, that this works in a sensible way. Now, uh, we implemented, together with the Aloha Editor folks, um, one plugin, which is the Captioned Image plugin. And what we're doing is taking an image that is just annotated with uh, a data-caption attribute to represent the caption, as well as a data-align attribute to represent the alignment. What we're doing is um, automatically adding a caption for that, so we're rendering that uh, around the image. And now we can move things around along with the caption the way it should be. And even more nicely, you can actually edit the caption right in place, thanks to Aloha Editor. Um, and Aloha, has, Aloha Editor also has this really cool API called the Repository API. We're currently only implementing it partially. We're only implementing it for links. So if, we're, if you're creating a link, and you want to link to some content on your website, instead of having to find that link manually, you can just start typing the node title, and it finds it, and it's inserted right away. <laughs> so let's uh, save this piece of content and look at the resulting HTML. We can ignore those. <laughs> They're just notices. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it still works. <laughs> so, um, as you can see right here, we were looking at an image with a lot of extra markup around it to make the caption possible. Right, right here, there's just an image tag with a source attribute and a data align attribute and a data caption attribute. So, Aloha cleaned up after itself. Um, and all the other. Um, Markup also is sensible. So instead of having empty lines, breaks, line breaks, really, there's no p text because that's what a lower generates and that's what's sensible HTML. And I don't know, but I think this is pretty clean HTML. So. Ah. And that's actually the end of my demo as well. So. So those are all the features in the new uh, Spark distribution. So what's next? Um, Drupal 8. So we've worked our butts off on this functionality for Drupal 7. That's what we spent the last like three months working on. And now what we would really like to do is we'd like to shift our focus into making this stuff happen so it's available out of the box for everybody installing Drupal 8 so that we can start to you know, be really proud of like Drupal's out of the box experience and make it really kick ass, especially as compared to our competitors. Um, so what can you do to help? This morning, uh, all morning, these poor people who <laughs> were cooped up in a hotel room all day. Oh, that is German. I don't know what that is. <laughs> anyway, I don't know. We, uh, we held a bunch of uh, birds of a feather session this morning <clears throat> that, uh, where we uh, met with uh, uh, community folks that are involved in these things, interested, end users, all kinds of stuff. And we took a whole bunch of notes um, and uh, these all link off to core issues where we'll be discussing this after DrupalCon. Um, but, you know, a lot of things about the goals of the initiative, other things people in the community have been doing, um, sort of the, uh, the, you know, community impressions, that kind of thing. And, and what we're trying to do is come out of each of these with, uh, by the end of the week, with a, with a good roadmap of what needs to happen. Um, so, like, one such roadmap we can take a look at. <clears throat> is the roadmap on uh, the in-place editing stuff. So we actually have a core issue which outlines the, uh, the battle plan for this, and this was developed in concert with uh, Daniel Kudvine's son, uh, Dave Reed, Nate Quicksketch, uh, you know, kind of the community folks involved in this thing. Um, you know, we, we've been having phone calls with them, showing them our stuff, and so these are all the, you know, it's a lot of work, right? Um, so we, we definitely need help, uh, you know, we, we're hoping that if the community reception to this is, is, feels good, then we would put a lot of effort into Drupal 8 core. If it feels like we're gonna get smacked over the face of the frying pan at every step, then we're probably gonna stay on Drupal 7. So please don't smack us in the face of the frying pan. That'd be great. Um, but yeah, we really wanna fix a lot of these underlying things in core because, um, you know, these, Spark is an initiative that really helps transcend some of the other initiatives. It touches mobile, it touches the box and layouts initiative, it touches a lot of different things so that we could help, you know, funnel some of Aqua's engineering resources and then get, you know, collaborate with community members and all this kind of stuff. So that's what we would like to do following DrupalCon. 
Um, so yes, thank you. Let us know what your feedback is. Um, I have booked a bathroom for right after this session, but we might as well just meet in the hallway because the bathrooms are way over in the West End. So if you want to ask us questions, if you want to sign up to help implement some of this stuff, any of that kind of thing, talk to us outside. We'd be happy to talk. We'll be at the conference. There are two code sprints happening uh, on Friday. The uh, one around the responsive layouts and uh, mobile toolbar kind of things, um, and another one around the inline editing WYSIWYG stuff. So if that stuff sounds cool to you, please come and join us. We'd be happy to have your help, and uh, thank you. Thank you for listening. <laughs>